Not too long. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Samer, Samer Atallah. I'm an associate professor of economics. I'm the associate dean uh, for research and graduate studies at AUC School of Business. I'm very, very, very pleased to see you here without your masks. Today is the first day uh, where mask is not uh, obligatory. So thank you for coming. I see students, faculty. Uh, I won't be talking a lot. I'm just here to introduce uh, a good friend of the School of Business and um, our guest uh, in the Wheeler Brown lecture on leadership, uh, Dean John Foster. He's the Dean of uh, Henry School of Business in Africa. Uh, he has a lot of years of experience in leadership and innovation and management uh, and leadership in schools of business. Uh, he's come to visit us here in Cairo. He has a very fascinating biography. I don't think I'll give him due justice. One thing that I find very fascinating and I'll, I emphasize that I will highlight is a pilot. So this is for me uh, a really inspiring thing. So uh, he has a lot of stories to tell us about leadership and the future of work. Uh, so without further ado, please join me and welcome John to his lecture. Um, uh, I'm so sorry I haven't got a seat. I mean, is there on this? <laughs> I have nothing else. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll try and keep it very short. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say it for too long. Okay. <laughs> I'm John. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's such an honor for me to be here. I've not been to the American University in Cairo until yesterday. And I'm absolutely blown away. In fact, I'm, I'm talking. I want my daughter to come here. She's living in South Africa. She's 18. I think this is a thing. It's just got such a nice atmosphere. You know, people sitting around, and I know you've got academically high standards, terrifying high standards, actually, because we are also a triple accredited business student. You are too. I hate to say it, but you look better than us. I'm annoyed. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll get going. But it's great. So, my name is John. I'm going to talk a bit about leadership. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about the imposter syndrome in a minute. The imposter syndrome. I feel like a total imposter standing up here talking about leadership. I'm going to go home to my 18-year-old girl, to my 16-year-old boy and my wife, and there's no way they think I'm a leader. I mean, I can hardly get a word in. So you're washing up and cleaning the floors and saying, yes, dear, no, dear. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different world. So I'm fascinated by leadership. And if there's one thing I can say that's really helped me in my life is teach what you want to learn. So if you want to learn something, teach it. You know, because we tend to think the great professors, they're standing there and you're waiting, oh, please give me the world of wisdom. Oh, thank you, great professor, your word of wisdom. You know, it's not like that. You know, <laughs> I'm standing there like that, waiting up for you. You know, I mean, everyone's trying to learn from each other. So I'm fascinated by power, by leadership. And the reason I'm interested in leadership it's not about, I want to be a leader. It's because I've done many things in my life, many of them very stupid, and some things have worked. But I have a passion for them. But I have young kids, and they're worried that the world they're going to grow up into isn't going to be here in 20 years. They're really sincerely worried. How can that be? But I look at them, and I feel the anxiety. I grew up in England when the Cold War was on. You know, my brother was a nuclear bomber pilot. We used to worry about being attacked by nuclear weapons when I was seven, ten years old. Can you believe it? Maybe you can believe it now with Ukraine. You know, <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. But um, I know what it feels like to be like that. So I think what leadership is about is having a, having a calling. And the other thing is about knowing that, knowing that, why me? Why me? Why should it be me? Well, why not you? Look behind you. Who else is there? They're not going to do it. Actually, it's you. It's you. You're going to have to take on that leadership role. Don't be scared. Make a fool of yourself. Lots. You know, because people don't remember very much. And the ones, well, don't put it on social media. Avoid social media when you're making a fool of yourself. Whatever you do, that'll last forever. So, hi. I'm really nice to meet you. Sorry, it's nice to see you. But anyway, so I'll get, I'll get talking. So, oh, because it's good. So it's a good thing when you're giving a talk, you use the three T's. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. So that's what public speaking is. So what I'm going to tell you 
I'm going to tell you some of the things I find interesting about leadership. I'm going to talk about power, from the words of Dr. Jeffrey Pfeffer, Stanford, MIT, and then where he is. I'm going to talk a little bit about situational leadership. That's a simple model of leadership that is very practical. I'm then going to talk about purpose, why we're doing these things. I'm going to look at some of the things that drive me and why I think, the, you know, why you have to be a leader. But the one thing I would say above all else, that there's only one thing that matters for a leader. The biggest thing is a sense of purpose. It's your purpose. What is your purpose? And I don't mean a performative purpose that will look great on social media and that everyone will say, well done, John, you're looking very fantastic. But the purpose that burns you up inside the one that scares you to do anything about. I walk around here and I see these pictures of the 2011 revolution and there's fantastic artwork <coughs> there. And it inspires me. I mean, I've, I've already posted all over my social media. I've taken the photographs and it inspires me. You know, that's, those people, and probably you people there in the middle of that, were scared at the time. But yet you made, you made real change. And that I have, I have no words to say how much I respect that and how I feel I wish I'd done that myself. You know, so that's, that's incredible. So let me have a, a run through a few. I'll be opening for questions, and I actually don't mind if you interrupt, but I'm not so confident about what I'm going to say about So I'm quite happy you interrupt. Um, so I do have to work out how to Ah, found another way to do it. So I'm going to start by saying how great we are at my business school. I'm doing this on purpose, I'll explain why that is. So we have a business school, that's not my business school. <clears throat> One of the key points uh, that you need in leadership is a capacity to improvise when things go wrong. So one of the things that great leaders do is the capacity to improvise. Scholarship people in the UK. One of the people I give scholarships to is a rock musician, very famous rock drummer and comedians and other people. And the reason for that is when I go on the road, when I work with these people, they've done an MBA, nothing, nothing throws them. They can take a situation like this, it doesn't matter what it is, and they have been working with the situation. What do you do when something goes wrong as a leader? Okay. Oh my goodness, this was real. If you've got a purpose, you're thinking, okay, that way, that way didn't work. I've got to come at it from another angle now. I've got to get my message from this angle. And when you go on the road with rock musicians, they've been doing that for 20 years, managing their bands, managing all that sort of stuff. Hello. If I do, it's terrible. It's <laughs> So here's another rule, rule one of improvisation. If you're an improvisational leader, can you set up for it? That's improv. Okay, throw it at me. That's not improv. So when you're a leader and you're working in improvisational mode, you accept the offer. Whatever it is that comes your way, you catch it. And then you work with it. You don't drop it on the floor. So improvisational rules, and if you go to improvisation theaters, whatever comes your way, you accept it and you work with it. If you are trying to make a super tanker in life, it's going from A to B, and something gets in your way, you become paralyzed because there's nothing you can do because your plan has been disrupted. Great leaders, I think, are great improvisers. They're able to improvise whatever they do, okay, and make things work. So this is our campus in Johannesburg. This is our gender transformation over, over 20 years, 10 years. We've gone from 80% men to 20% women to 55% women on our campuses and in our company. We've gone from 
um, 90% black people, and that's in the African sense, all people who are non European, you know, to 80 85%. And we transform that in 10 years. And that's done with a level of quality that's been really important. Okay, so I'm going to be, I'm going to work a method. So this is our school's growth over 10 years from uh, 108 MBAs to 324, from 48 graduates to 1,800, 600 to 4,500 students. Revenue shot up like that. So it's been a powerful and useful school. It's really worked. So I've now established my credentials as a speaker of some power. I have performance behind me, right? True. And I have real performance. And that's just this job. Okay. And now I'm self-promoting, right? If you want to be a leader, you have to know how to use power. And one of the, and we don't like this form of power. We find it distasteful and bad. One of the most important ways to handle power is to know what power is and how people in the real life get power. This research by Jeffrey Pfeffer has looked at great leaders we admire, has looked at dictators, looked at all sorts of other people. His point of view is there are plenty of people in the world who are leaders and who have power, but there are plenty of people who are the wrong people. If you have a purpose and want to be a leader, you have to learn how, to, how in the real world people get and use power. Then, and he teaches this, he doesn't tell you how you should do how, what your character is. He doesn't tell you how you use it. It's your choice, how you use the way to get power. Business schools and universities try to mold people so they have the character to use power well. But these are the seven rules from his book, The Seven Rules of Power, from Jeffrey Pfeffer, a very famous professor and organization, public consultant, I'm going to talk to him. First one is get out of your own way. Second one is break the rules. I'm going to go through these one by one. Third one is show up in a powerful fashion. Third one is the fourth one is create a powerful brand. Then it's network relentlessly. And networking is not just saying hi to somebody. I've met you once, but we don't have a relationship. I don't know if you trust me. You do because I'm standing here. I don't know if I'm worth trusting. Maybe I'm not. But if I violate your trust in a small way and repair it quickly, you'll trust me. So one of my colleagues who runs a very famous business school, when he has clients, he tries to make them unhappy in a little way so he can make them very happy quickly. <laughs> and the trust relationship accelerates upwards. It's a good trick. And you have to use your power because unless you use your power, your power will fade away. And then once you've acquired power, most people will forget how you got it. Now, these are distasteful rules and we probably don't want to know about them. But the point that Jeffrey... Jeffrey talks about is that, is that unless you learn how to use power, you're never going to get it. You're not going to be able to use it for good, and people who are using it for bad will be in your way. So the first one is embrace your imposter syndrome. I know when I became a dean, when I became a chair of this, or became something else, I'm looking at it and said, like I did when I started, why me? Who am I to do this? I know what I'm like. I know my neuroses and my weaknesses. I know all that stuff. I've embraced my shadow side. You know a lot of that. So I know that you can probably see that to me as well. Does that mean I must not try? No. 
you must feel your imposter syndrome. You must say, oh, this thing is sitting on my shoulder like a big parrot saying, you're useless, you can't do anything. No. On the other shoulder is a lovely little cat saying, you can reach that you can do things. Listen to the little cats, not the big parrot. Okay, because what you have to do, you have to act as if you act your way into something rather than just being at first. You have to show up and embrace your imposter. You have to say to your imposter syndrome, hi, I see you. I see you. Look at it. Say, come and have a cup of tea with me. Come and sit down with me. I see you. And at that moment, it evaporates. It gets from big to small. Just keep acting. In time, if you embrace your imposter syndrome, everything you do, every time somebody, you are thinking you're a fraud, just say, yeah, that's great. I'm in the zone I need to. That's the first one. Okay. The next rule here is break the rules. Now, this is obviously something that in academia we try not to do when we're managing quality standards, etc. It's a very bad thing to do. But when underdogs don't play by the conventional rules, this research shows they have a almost a triple increase in possibility of success. If you're coming into an organ, like apps, we're growing apps. Remember, we're growing new organization. If we play by the established rules, we'll never get anywhere. We have to think, what do we have to do? What, what we take for granted, we have to do. Let's violate that in a constructive way. Because sometimes rules and laws are not useful. Laws that prevent us doing anything about climate change, for example, are not productive to the human race. They become shackles. Laws get out of date. And sometimes, as you know, we have to break them. So think from first principle. Elon Musk, whatever you think of him, he's developed a lot of things. He looks at, how do I get from LAX to downtown LA? Traffic's terrible. Oh, okay, I'm going to go down. I'm going to dig a tunnel. <coughs> Crazy. Oh, maybe I can go, to, go and live on Mars. I'm going to build a rocket. <clears throat> and he does this not because he's got crazy ambition, because he's an engineer who is repulsed by rules. He will go back to the problem and think it through from the base, from the base, intellectually, as if the problems that everyone tells you can't do, as if they didn't exist. And more often than not, he's found a way forward. Another interesting thing is to appear powerful. The reality is, I mean, I've lost all my traffic, so I put on a tie. I hope it's a tiny way that I feel a bit more respectable here, because all my bags are stuck in the airport. You know, wearing wearing my, my trainers in front of you. I don't have a suit. But you need to appear powerful to people, because people respond. Why does Donald Trump wear, wear a red tie all the time? Why does, he go, why does he spend so much time on his hair? They do, because they show up with power language and power talk. You might not like it, but it works. We as human beings respond emotionally to these things way before our rationality can even click in. And even though we might rationally understand how we're responding, our emotions keep winning. Remember that girlfriend? Remember that boyfriend you should never have got together with? Why? You know, sometimes your emotions take over and your rational mind is saying something, something different. Okay, so this marketing professor and many more the cognitive resources are limited, especially now, and that's why in times of stress, people who show powerful social security, they get, they get power as well. There's only another three of these. Um, this one is build a powerful brand. Yeah. The brand, the brand American University Cara, is not this. It's not this logo. Brand is nothing you can touch. The brand of the American University of Cairo sits in each of your heads, and it's a different thing for each of you. Each of you have interpreted what American University of Cairo means, and you have a construct in your head built up from your experiences, what you've seen, the relationship you've had that's just got a network of associations in your brain. So if you invited the American University of Cairo to dinner with you tomorrow night, what sort of person would the American University of Cairo be? I realize that you are climate scientists and activists in the world. And so when I think about how we engage with this, I'm worried that we're not showing up enough to stop people with great power doing the I'm particularly worried because I'm English at the moment, it's new economies of all this trust. So we have to understand that we have to build a brand. 
output is not in you, it's what you have created for other people to, to believe in. If your story is incoherent, if when you, you're close to somebody and they're resonating that you feel unnatural or dishonest, your brand will come to value. So it's much safer to make a brand close to what you really are. Okay? Even if you're a bit of an idiot in your own mind. So you raise your eyebrows. So you, yeah. Yeah. So be what you are because your authentic brand is always going to be stronger than the one you architect for some social media fantasy. Okay. So understanding how to manipulate brand is, is one of those super skills in the world. Okay. Network relentlessly. And uh, this one, uh, this one, yes. In a Raytheon survey, they took a bunch of executives and they gave a bunch of them skills in how to network and a bunch of them not. And the result in terms of promotion was much higher for the people who had learned how to network. Now, you, you and me might say we've networked after we come out of this room. You know, I can connect with you on LinkedIn, you can connect with me with your connection. I always worry about this. I worry that we confuse networking with an authentic relationship. So how do we move from a network connection to a relationship connection that's going to allow you to move forward? Yeah. And then two more rules that Jeffrey Tuff has come up with. Um, here we are. This one is a scary one. Usual power. So when you get given a position of power, when you're doing something, well, Lana gets made, made of abs, and Samir takes on another role. Don't want your, Samir's doing marathons now. He's doing, he's doing the Ironman. Respect. Okay? I, he immediately has a brand different from me now. He has power over me, but I'm scared of somebody who does that. But when you have power, you have a short window to do something. You look at Lyndon Johnson when he became president of the United States. He immediately, within hours, had a whole campaign of the transition he was going to do. Whether you like it or not, and he acted immediately in a short time in the early days before your enemies start ganging up against you. Your enemies are anyone who doesn't believe in you. They're not real enemies. And you have that time. So the main thing is work fast to get, get the actions changed, okay? Your enemies last longer than your friends. Okay? Enemies last longer than their friends. They have longer memories. So that after a while, if you're in a position of power, your position builds up and it gets harder and harder to hold on to. And so sometimes you need to be fairly ruthless. The more precarious your position comes, the less chance you have to do something. So let's say you get power, you've got a really good agenda, you want to do something for the club. Act now. Don't wait. Act. Even though some people might say you're violating some expectations of inclusion, it's better to move forward. If you use power, it signals you have power. So people, people respond to what they truly believe is power, not to what your claims are power. So when you're actually using power, they immediately know and understand that you really have it. If you can't hear me at the back, put up your hand. Okay. It's okay. And success excuses everything. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a story. This is not something that people like to hear. But if you do that in the end, sometimes you have poor means and, and you continue to carry on with power. I'm not talking about this being a good thing. I'm just saying it seems to be a human characteristic. And when people have got power and use it, many people start adapting to that and rationalizing some of the bad things that that person did to get there and forgetting. That's why we have to be so super conscious in the way we do things. Um, that's why you get so many people who get very powerful and then become philanthropists. Because they have caused, there are so many dead bodies, metaphorically, in their wake, that they try and sort out their karma by doing a lot of good work in the later half of their life and putting all their money back. You could argue, or some people understood <laughs> that they need to do something well. This is a baseball coach. Um, so the idea of power is that power is not just a latent energy. It's, it's, it's a kinetic energy. It's something that needs you. Power always wants to achieve or win something. So if we don't believe that winning is everything, we're deluding ourselves. But if you have power, you, whether it's a good or a bad objective, you want to achieve that. You want to win that objective. And that's why Jeffrey Sutton says that these rules of power are really important for all of us to know. Now, having thoroughly, having thoroughly disgusted you with the um, actual rules of power, we have to think very carefully about well, how you know how to get power, how are you going to use it? 
And this is the domain, the difference between power and leadership, true leadership. Most leaders are too subliminally, they study the art of power. Quite often, well, they don't talk about it because they feel ashamed. Jeffrey Sutton has written a book about it. Let's put it out there. I met the president of an unnamed um, South African or an unnamed African country about three weeks ago at his house. I went there, I said, hi, Mr. President. I gave him that book. I did, that's pretty cheeky on me. I just gave the president who was elected a year ago of an African country a book on power. And I thought, why not? You know, maybe he'll be annoyed with me. Maybe he'll remember me. You know, and maybe he'll use it because it's actually quite helpful. If you want to get the right things done, if you want to get done what you truly believe in, you need to learn how to use power. Now, how do you choose what to do? How do you choose what to do? Because you're guaranteed that the wrong people will get power if you don't do it. My country, this is a problem. We have the highest Gini coefficient in the world. The largest amount of money in the smallest amount of people's hands, and the least amount of money in the majority's hands anywhere in the world. This is an obscenity on humanity. It's an absolute, someone we cannot live with, and it got worse. So I think our objective in South Africa is to reduce the Gini coefficient, to create more distribution of wealth, to allow, to allow to get that. I cannot do that by wish fulfillment. If I'm going to be a leader, we have to learn how to use power, and, and we have to manage that. This is something that has to decrease, and it's something that's killing country, we're not getting enough people in power. Here's, a, here's another thing I worry about. I'm just going to show you this. I'm just going to show you this here. This is Vietnam's exports a few years ago, 20 years ago. Look at what they, this stuff is all the high-tech stuff. This color, these colors, these browns and yellows are things you dig out the ground or grow, okay? No factor, you know, no factor, no complicated, no, not very sophisticated. Things that don't really grow the majority. Look how they've changed in, in, in 20 years. Look how those, look what's happened. All that high tech stuff in that bottom right hand corner, it's suddenly getting there, and now look what it is. It's all over. That's the transformation of the Vietnamese economy in 20 years. They now have an economy which they've used, which is now providing opportunity for people. It's giving high degree of tech, technical capabilities, educating people, there are universities, there are roads, there are healthcare systems, there are complex, complex uh, ways of doing business. And that country is now competitive internationally. If I look at Egypt, okay, Egypt, well, that's you, 20 years ago. Let's see how much of this has sprung to the middle. What do you think? Has it got, have you transformed your economy or are you still stuck in an agricultural age? Who thinks you've transformed your economy? Sure. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Who thinks you haven't transformed the economy? Thank you very much. Well, let's see who's right. This gentleman, the improv actor, against the young student at the back there. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, sir, the student wins. You actually have transformed your economy. I don't think that's made you a loser. It's just made you a realist. Because actually, we haven't got the rules. So Egypt has done some really good transformation. And if I look at, if I compare South Africa, which is South Africa's transformation, which is negligible over 20 years, it hasn't changed its economy structure at all. It's still stuck in what it did. Vietnam has grasped Industry 4.0. It's grasped the technical revolution. It's grasped multinational business. It's grasped high-tech capabilities. It's got complex clusters of capability. Entrepreneurship is a really big thing in Vietnam. And it's not a big thing in South Africa. Young people coming out of university in Vietnam mm -hmm. to feel they have an opportunity. Young people coming out of university in South Africa are 40 to 50 percent of them are unemployed long term, even with university degrees. That's an advance in human nature. You cannot allow that. That is poor, poor leadership, not personalized. So we have a choice of what we do. But let's look again here. Let's look at another thing. A lot, I, this is my last point I want to act on. This is something from Kate Raworth. Um, the environmentalist will know Kate Raworth. She was a director of Oxfam, an economist, very clever person. She invented the idea called donuts economics. The idea of the donut, that there are two boundaries. There's this boundary and there's that boundary. The inside boundary 
is a social foundation that all countries need to have. Now, old-fashioned economics are not based on this. They're based on a growth model. Old-fashioned economics thinks that if you grow an economy, like a very interesting story here, that eventually there will be more inequality, but later, eventually, the quality will lift up. Life has proved that that doesn't work like that. The, the inequality just seems to grow, and people don't come up with it. So with this one, this is income and work, education. We cannot fail in these. Peace and justice, political votes, social equity, gender equality, housing, networks, energy, water, food, health. All these are boundaries that need to be managed by leaders, by business people, and not just delegated to government. <laughs> On the other hand, there's another boundary which we can't damage either. And that's nitrogen and phosphorus loading in the soils, chemical pollution, ocean acidification, climate change. Ozone layer depletion, air pollution, biodiversity loss, land conversion, fresh water withdrawal, the water collapsing, all things you are hugely familiar with, right? What happens is we are now arguing that leadership in the future is leadership that manages both the students, you, you, make this world. It's on you, right? Just being a course, no, you, you are, you're taking out. Mantle of leadership. Okay, so I'm going to look at the next one here and let's see what's really going on in our world. Okay, and the state of the world now is more like this. All of these boundaries are being transgressed internally, socially. You can't build a world, let alone an let alone economy or a nation, let alone a business, let alone a university, if you transgress all those boundaries. What can you? build a world that's going to sustain if you keep transgressing all these boundaries. You can see that that model leads to disaster. I don't want my kids to grow up in a world that's in the So I'm going to give myself the rest of my years to fighting that. I'm not very good. I'm a complete imposter. I know that. <laughs> but heck, I'm here. Why not? I'm going to have a go. Lots of people beat me up in the way. That's life. That's leadership. You get beaten up. But you have a purpose. You must accept it. But that's not how it ought to be. So my view is, if you're going to be leaders going forward, and, and this I can give you, it's, uh, it's just some small dimensions of this, and this is saying that we, we have to move from into sort of from growth economics into this donut model, into markets has been self-contained, as markets, you know, in, in, the economy is better than everyone everywhere, in the markets, in the people, in the homes, what we live there. We're looking at mechanical equilibrium, simple views of systems. We need to develop sophisticated systems thinking. There's, a, there's a, an article that Elliot Jacques wrote, um, wrote some very interesting work on, on advanced thinking, stratified systems theory. We tend to be walking around with our eyes down here because we want our jobs. You know, good managers are there. Leaders are there. Leaders are looking up here. Long horizon. Leaders are looking up here. We all pull down for that. But we always have to be pulling our heads up. If we're not doing that, if you are not looking at that, you cannot be a leader. You're a tactician. You're a small leader in a little organization, but you're not a world leader. And you're more than capable of becoming world leaders, aren't you? No. You can see it in your eyes. You are. <laughs> and you will. I'm absolutely sure. So we have, to, we have to understand complexity. We have to understand social adaptability. We have to understand that the infinite growth is impossible without massive technological change and massive social change. And we have to think of regeneration, reduce, reuse, recycle, the whole thing, repair. We have to think of regenerative methods rather than continually consumptive methods. And we have to be cautious about how we want growth. We have to think more about eudaimonia, eudaimonia, which is a Greek word for quality of life, in general, thriving and well being, that we do about anything else. So, about my last slide, I think, um, well, you know what, that's it. Thank you for listening. I would have 10 minutes before the next. Professor would like to ask, but I know yeah. he's, a, you know he's a climate scientist and yeah. the environment, yeah. so I'm very interested in this. So I'll give the, uh, maybe we'll take a few questions. So I want to hand over uh, to Ali, but also when the students have passed the so I want to give the talk to Ali. Okay. My, my comment is why do people, when they talk about leadership, it has to be tempted with elitism. And why can't we sort of have a little bit of democratizing the concept? 
you talk about situational uh, leadership. Uh, for me, well, I'm self-organizing. When you talk about this, you're really talking about everybody is a leadership potential. You cannot talk about leadership without talking about governance, because look at most of the powerful leaders. Charles de Gaulle was ousted by 1968 youth demonstrations in the streets, because people were fed up with this brilliant leader. So we need to sort of talk a little bit. I, I really wish 20 years down the road, I mean, somebody was going to come and write a book that kind of say what the hell they were talking, they were thinking of, which is a, a repeat of Pfeiffer's early book. Because you're really promoting self eliticism you're, you're, you're promoting non-community driven work. You're, 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 you're even talking about non, without governance. Now, I have another comment, which is Vietnam. Vietnam is proxy China. So bear in mind the brilliant 20 years leap that they've done is because the Chinese were doing submarine activities. They've moved all their, their, their activities into Vietnam as a way in case the US uh, does an embargo on the trade. So it's not that this is, this is a brilliant country by itself. Thank you. That last point, that totally gets a very good point as well. So we use examples to simulate argument. So my whole first part of my talk is something that I'm fundamentally slightly revolted by. The idea that these power structures are necessary, and I want to have a democratic engagement with everybody. We want to have completely um, environments of our work that are incredibly inclusive, incredibly um, changing, incredibly people talking to each other. And, that, and the point is that even that polarity between with a directive leadership and inclusive leader, the fact that we make it a polarity, I think is an error. Because I think we need both at different times. I think the output of the use of power in times where the system is poor, sometimes we have to get that. If we don't get that power, it's trying to be so, so engaging um, for a long time. What happens is the change in our environment gets beyond the tipping point, as we're getting beyond the tipping point now. So if you look at Extinction Rebellion, I'm sure you know Roger Hallam, Central Rebellion well. His approach to this, I'm not saying I agree with it, is absolutely implacable. He is implacably wanting citizen assemblies. He's wanting to make it absolutely clear we're going to have billions dying of climate change within 20 years. And he's a guy who started, yet at the same time, he's developed a way of governing Extinction Rebellion, which is not entirely working, which is based on really good use of law, really excellent use of police assemblies. But the citizen assemblies are microscopic compared to this size in a room, in this room. Now, to create a movement, which is what you want, a potential rebellion where you get 15, 16 percent, or even less on your side, is what he wants. So his mechanics are how do you create a movement? But what's loaded up, what's loaded up against him is so much. And why I'm presenting Jeffrey Sutton's work is that Jeffrey Sutton has stood up and said, here is something about power. I don't even say I agree with you, but that's what I present. He said, if you want to understand power, these are the dynamics of how you choose power. And if you want to change things quickly, maybe we need to think even more ruthlessly about how we make these things happen. I don't want my kids to grow up in that room. That's what I'm saying. It's a fantastic question, which I don't have really the answer for. You know, it's a very good conversation. Thank you for that. Uh, questions from the young students? So, another, yes, a young student, yes. Not uh, not young. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you, a wonderful lecture. Um, actually, uh, we had on the floor of the British University in Egypt, the place I'm, I'm teaching, I'm an associate professor of public administration. We have Professor Waira Clark from Henley Business School in UK. And Waira is such a wonderful lady. She was in 2019, and we were talking about this getting away from the taxonomy of the actual leadership, the use of power, into the SLT in its near meaning and the use of power. And we were just uh, highlighting uh, whether you are in a situation of being able and willing or unwilling and able and this kind of rhythm. So I, I find myself related very much to whatever you're displaying today about uh, when is it exactly using this type of power. So whether you will use an expert or reference type of power, so it will be definitely according to uh, the situation. So I just wanted to have more reflection on that from your side. Okay. If you have to leave, please do. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get it. It's 
So can you summarize that question in one sentence for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's a lot. So the, I mean, the types of influence, when do you use the power, the powerful tool that you have as a leader? Uh, I, I had a, a coach, and I was, I thought it not really literally, unsurprisingly, you might say. Um, I was also a hippie, and something very different in my life as well. So I've been through a number of different directions. The model I use that helps me think about that, I use a situational leadership model. And what it says is it, it, it's between people's capability and their commitment. And when somebody is very incapable of having committed, they often need very directive stuff because they're not. When they become a bit lost, they're a bit more committed, not very capable, a bit more direct and a bit more coach. When they become highly committed and still not quite capable, then you're doing a lot of coaching and benefit. They're very capable. Very committed, you just leave them to it, Nothing, yeah. yes. and you just say, Well done, here's some more money. Guess what? What do you need? You know, you get that, and then you're right behind them, but you do that cheerily. But actually, what that's doing is very useful because I find the biggest error I find in organizational leadership that people don't know paradoxically, they don't know, they don't know when to direct people, they're, they're so hands off. So, some of the people who really need direction, and then you have the other problem where powerful people cannot. And I'm guilty of this too. You cannot stop directing people, being explaining, mansplaining, something explaining, not telling everybody when they don't need to. So you actually need, you need to have your own courage. You need to have your own critical. I would say as leaders, you need to surround yourself with people who are going to be very critical of you. Just take it on and take it off because you will grow. The trouble with strong leadership and long sets is you don't surround yourself with people. And therefore you get trapped in them. Any more questions? I have a comment. Oh, okay, please. Can I add to those seven things? A leader without the followers would be able to lead, and this mainly depends more or less on the relationship between the leader and his followers. So, as far as I know, Nelson Mandela, and he's one of the best leaders of the world. Uh, his leadership was so handleless, and he used to sit in the tribe uh, in the circle, so that he would be the last one. And uh, he would be able to differentiate between him and the others. So, just wanted to add something. Nelson Mandela used to get really cross. Yeah. He thought a lot of people didn't like him because he didn't do what they wanted. The public perception of what Nelson Mandela is, is true, is that he was an exceptional and fantastic. He wasn't some saint who was living there. You could get absolutely livid with people. And, and it's like the righteous indignation. So there were times when he got very cross. And he got plenty of critics now. The thing about him was that he was just such an inspiring example of a person who was willing to put himself in the sideline. And when you met him, which unfortunately I didn't, you know, when you met him, people say you just knew that he was truly listening. That he got you because he had such a life, he didn't fundamentally feel himself a class people. He'd been in Britain for 27 years, he struggled and survived. He did that by engaging with people, by looking people straight in the eye, seeing each person's humanity. Because fundamentally, he didn't feel himself superior. He felt himself gifted and endowed and skills. And he had a purpose. And he had a purpose. And that's why he was a cool one. Secret of power is purpose. You know what's wrong with purpose. So just do nothing else. Cultivate the purpose and the things you believe in. So they're bigger than you. And serve people. Serve your family, community, humanity. Cultivate those purposes. Not, I need you for a moment. Whatever. Maha? Maha? I just comment. I'll do the... Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Famous book called uh, 48 Years uh, Old. Written by, oh, yeah, somebody else, yeah. Yeah, so, so the thing about the rules, in, 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 and some of them you can be misinterpreted as being hypocritical. Well, they are. I mean, the other thing is that we have stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would love not to be a hypocrite. I'm still consuming things I shouldn't consume. I shouldn't be eating beef. I shouldn't be driving up to you. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't imagine that anything I say is a value, really. You know, and we're all stuck in a, a level of competency, one level, 
much. So it's, it's really difficult. So anyone who writes a book, there will be five books contradicting it. So who's right? Um, my question is by no means as extensive as the other ones, but I thought it was quite ironic how the second route is to bring all books, and then you proceeded to list another five <laughs> and mention how we should always use our power and these seven rules are going to unlock the greatest mysteries of life. And so it takes to be a good leader. So here's another saying for you. Rules are for the guidance of the wise and the obedience of the gifts. <laughs> Rules are for the guidance of the wise and the obedience of fools. That was still well. Life is full of contradictions. Um, we are full of contradictions in our lives. We can't, we can't avoid that. Rules are for the obedience of the guidance of the wise and the obedience of fools. Okay. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just saying it's an interesting point. Uh, we're running out of time, but I'm going to leave maybe a few seconds if it's out there. Any questions? questions? Thank you. Good. So I've, I've got away very lightly because I deserve to be beaten up quite strongly for my certain <laughs> polemic positions. <laughs> and, you know, but it gets the people talking. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.